Welcome back to another episode of What's On Your Mind and uh, Happy New Year to all of you watching. Uh, to kick things off for us in 2021, I've got Anthony Iser and Jason McDonald joining me on the show today and a Happy New Year to you guys as well. Um, I don't think it's going to take much really to beat last year uh, for most of us, but um, while sort of 2020 saw many of our lives negatively impacted over the year, um, markets certainly ended on a pretty different note. Um, in fact, after the rally in Q4 of last year, many of the world's equity indices uh, ended on a positive note in the positive region, um, quite significantly in some cases, and not least of, uh, of all in the US as well. So um, with that in mind, I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say today. And uh, Jason, why don't you kick things off for us? Uh, yeah, sure. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, good to be back. Um, although it's it's a it's a new calendar year, um, plus a change, I guess. Um, so uh, obviously uh, we've had a relatively strong start to the year as well, um, equities wise. So just want to talk a little bit about the general situation first. Um, I uh, I'll talk about my um, the changes that I've made over the course of December and um, coming into you know the first week of of the new of the new year a bit later on but just wanted to sort of um speak about a few things that i've been picking up on um in terms of i guess for me signs of i don't want to use the words that uh, greenspan famously used at the end of the last century but um i'm seeing shall we say a bit of frothiness um in quite a few areas and i just want to give you a few examples of that so you know, in, in no kind of particular order here. Um, I think everyone's well aware of the the increasing participation that we saw in 2020 of, of retail investors. Um, and to put some numbers on that, um, according to Citadel, um, last year at certain points, as, as much as 25% of trading volume um, in equities markets was uh, retail traders. And that, that's up from about 10% in the previous year. So that's quite a significant increase. Um, and not surprisingly in the US, you know, obviously we know that um, retail traders are very active on the options side of things. Um, so according to uh, some guys called Bianco Research, um, I've read a piece from them late last year. They were basically saying that um, if you look at the, the CBOE, so this is the, uh, uh, the options market, um, if you look at their rolling 22-day average, um, you've got more equity call options, around about 2 million per day uh, changing hands, um, which is the most that they've seen since 2011. Um, and on a ratio, in terms of trading calls versus puts, um, the ratio um, over that period has been about 2.37 calls per put traded, which is the highest this century. So I'm just putting these numbers out there as, as context. Um, if you look at uh, the private equity backed companies that, that came public last year, uh, this I had to take a second um, glance at. This is not um, a mistake of the approximately 50 private equity backed companies that, that IPO'd last year and came public. Um, they achieved total market value increases on the first day of trading compared to the most recent private market valuation that was done before they IPO'd of 660%. I repeat that, 660%. Okay. Um, a guy called Art Hogan, who used to be, Antti and I will, will know him as the, the previous head strategist at, at Jeffco at Jefferies. He's now chief market strategist at uh, some place called National Securities. Um, he put it this way. There is no doubt that the emergence of a much larger cohort of retail investors slash traders is moving markets. There seems to be an entire subculture of people that sort of follow the same things, talk to each other on social media and drive enthusiasm for individual issues. And sometimes it makes no fundamental sense to anybody. And I think there's the key word, fundamental. Um, it seems it, 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 it kind of seemed towards the end of last year that that. Um, looking at fundamentals almost hampered your progress in terms of analyzing, which is a weird situation to be in. Um, now, I'm not just going to pick on retail traders. So 
if we look at the, the December Bank of America uh, fund manager survey, that's done every month, um, you can see bullish sentiment also amongst the institutions. Um, they, the, the, the managers in that survey um, at the end of last year have allocated their highest exposure to emerging markets since 2010, but also at the same time remaining overweight in US and European equities. And of course, with um, more than half of them, overweight tech, not surprising. So that means that for the first time since the middle of 2013, they are now underweight cash uh, with only 4%, um, which means they've basically got no dry powder, um, really. Now that normally, according to Bank of America, um, presages some kind of a pullback, which you know over a very long term time period, averages um, a drawdown of 3%. Okay, big deal. Um, the point is, is that, you know, when you get to these types of allocations, you are looking at um, potentially, um, you know, an extreme situation. If we look at, um, I, I, I quite like this one, because I always think that um, people focus on insider selling, I think insider purchases are much more interesting, because when corporate insiders actually put their balls on the line when they actually put their money into some, into their own stock. I think that says something um, which is more important. So if we look at those numbers, um, basically in December, um, corporate insider purchases have fallen to their lowest level since uh, the end of 2017. Uh, to put that into context, in March of last year, before um, the Fed threw its kitchen sink and everything, um, we saw the heaviest insider buying that we'd ever seen since 2009, and we all know what happened in 2009. Um, another factor, the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. It's only been going since 1990. Last week, it reached its most accommodative level since uh, their records began in 1990. Um, another little bit of uh, price information here. So if we look at uh, the senior unsecured bonds of Ford, um, these are th this particular issue that I was looking at. Uh, they are due in 25 years' time. They're currently trading at 330 basis points, so that's about 3.3 percent over uh, the relevant treasuries. Um, now, back in early April, when obviously we had the carnage, they were trading at 938 basis points over treasuries, and where they trade now is even tighter than where they were at the end of January last year before all the proverbial hit the fan. Now, why is that of interest? I'll tell you why it's of interest, because in between March and May, all three of the major rating agencies downgraded Ford's debt to junk. This is sub-investment grade. Okay? Um, and now the last thing I'm going to throw at you, um, actually it's not quite the last thing, but this was the most amusing thing for me. So Elon Musk was... Uh, was tweeting a few days ago um, to his uh, merry band of followers uh, and basically recommending that they um, should start using an encrypted messaging app, um, which is called Signal. Um, so um, following the commands from the Supreme Commander, um, they not only uh, decided to get onto the app, but they then went out there and started buying stock of Signal um, and in fact, only yesterday, the stock of uh, Signal uh, was up 438%. The only problem here is that they're buying the wrong Signal. So Signal, the encrypted messaging app, is not listed. It's actually funded by a nonprofit organization. Um, so the stock that these guys have been buying, uh, we'll loosely call them investors, um, they've had this thing up from... On January the 6th, the stock closed at 60 cents. Now, this thing is so small, illiquid, and irrelevant, it trades OTC over the counter. So trade by appointment kind of thing. Uh, they've driven this thing up from 60 cents to an inch day high yesterday of just below $71. Um, I think uh, last week we saw the highest trading volume in this thing since it's gone public. Yesterday, we saw more than 2 million shares changing hands. January the 4th, first trading day of the year, not a single share of the stock was traded. This was pre the Musk tweet, not a single share. So Signal Advance, which is the, the, the recipient of this large S, 
um, they have reported no revenue in 2015 and 16, and uh, they now have a market cap of more than $3 billion. Now, this is a small component manufacturer. It is not the encrypted messaging app. Um, and lastly, because uh, I was reading about this yesterday, um, apparently CNBC tried to get hold of the company's sole full-time employee, Chris Heimel, who apparently did not immediately respond to a request for information. And I guess he's probably on the phone to his stockbrokers telling them to sell all of his options and shares. Anyway, why am I talking about this? Because it's another signal, uh, forgive the pun, didn't actually mean that. It's, it's, a, it's another sign that we are getting um, irrational behavior and we've got, you know, froth going on. I mean, we've all seen what's gone on with crypto, especially with uh, Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, and I just think that, uh, you know, caution is warranted. So the last thing that we're going to put up here on this particular uh, topic is um, what we call the euphoria chart. Now, this was actually uh, produced by uh, a combination of Citigroup and a couple of other analytic analytical companies. And they've got what's known as their panic euphoria model, and which we're going to be showing you on the screen now. And this is uh, going back to 1987, which is, um, as the historians out there will probably remember, um, was when we had uh, the stock, crash, stock market crash in, in October 87. Um, on the euphoria panic uh, model scale, um, as you can imagine, we are we are literally off the charts on the euphoria side of things. We are higher now than we were in terms of this euphoria signal than we were in the dot com in the dot com boom. So um, what I'm saying here is, you know, it's always very difficult to time markets, and it's not really something that we recommend, but. Um, on the basis that you know we have several um, signals here and, and anecdotal evidence of, um, shall we say, um, slightly odd behaviour and you know um, manager weightings in terms of being heavily overweighted, low on cash, and we've had some incredible returns generated, especially since the presidential election. Um, I think it's probably time, you know, to 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 be dialing things back a bit and, and becoming more cautious. And, and that's in fact what I've been doing with my own portfolio. So I was pretty long running into December. Um, saw some extraordinary gains um, in areas of the portfolio in December, and I've basically used the strength to lighten the load. And I'm essentially now running market neutral. So I'm not getting mega bearish saying that, you know, we have an enormous bear market that's about to, um, you know, be put upon us. But what I'm saying is that I personally am feeling a little bit uh, nervous of some of the valuations up here, some of the mar market and pricing levels. And basically, I've been taking risk off, um, you know, fairly gently as, as December has progressed and, and it's been good to lock in gains and I'm now es essentially market neutral. How does that how does that kind of weigh up with you, Anthony? Are you thinking the same thing about markets and being quite sort of frothy? Yes, Chris, I am and uh, Happy New Year, everyone. It's 36 degrees here in Melbourne today. It was beach and golf. Um, I can see the jumper on there, Jason. Probably got a little toaster under your desk, a little heater to keep those toes warm. So, uh, yes, it's um, there's froth sort of everywhere. And as Jason alluded to, uh, Greenspan's comments about irrational exuberance, that happened in 1996, and it was four years before um, markets peaked. So, um, yeah, as Jason said, this is not you know ringing of bells of tops of markets, but there's lots of things going on that just give you pause um, for, um, you know, sort of a, a try to assess the risk a little bit. So I'll just put up this chart here. Um, one thing, um, firstly, penny stocks have been driving volume, which is just crazy. So 18% uh, of the stock market yesterday was in five stocks. Uh, and this is by share number of shares, not by dollar value, but uh, five stocks that are all trading under a dollar. Um, that's just unheard of um, and reflecting speculation. 
And what happens is people move down, you know, move up in risk and down in price. Uh, and and why buy something at fourteen dollars when I can buy seven times as many of them at two dollars or four times ten, fourteen times as many at one dollar? So this chart here shows um, the share price performance um, this year so far uh, from the Russell three thousand. Just divided into share price, um, and if your share price is under two dollars, uh, your return's about twelve percent, um, and it uh, gets progressively lower as you move up to five dollars, to ten dollars, to twenty dollars, and then uh, and then fifty and one hundred. Makes no sense whatsoever, um, other than there's just a lot of froth and speculation going on. Um, my favourite sort of frothy story and just the sort of lack of fundamentals that I came across um, is a company called Zomedica. Zomedica, Z-O-M is the ticker. Um, they're a development stage co company, so uh, not actually producing very much as far as I can tell, focused on veterinarian uh, diagnostics and pharma products, uh, particularly for companion animals. So niche market, um, in November, this was a pe proper penny stock. It was trading at a uh, market cap of 35 mil. It is now 700 mil, um, having gone up 500 mil or so in the last couple of days. I just put up a picture now of one of my uh, uh, favourite people of 2020. It's the, uh, it's the Tiger King. And the reason I'm putting that up is I need to put up this next person who is Carol Baskin. Um, the arch nemesis of the Tiger King. If you didn't watch it on Netflix during the first part of last year, you don't know what you missed out on. Um, I would urge you to watch it, but just to highlight where markets are at the moment, um, Zomedica, the $500 million increase, uh, it was essentially driven by Carol Baskin doing a $299 cameo request. So basically doing a little pitch for the company's products at the start of her YouTube show. So Cameo, for those people who don't know it, is where celebrities, usually fairly minor, will take a fee and they'll give you birthday wishes. You know, you know my old football star might, uh, that your father might have uh, loved in the 70s, they'll, for 50 bucks, they'll say, happy birthday, Daryl, you know, good to see you, whatever. $299 she was paid. And she spoke about Zomedica's uh, products and loosely sort of talked that, you know, she might look at in, investing in their products, not investing in the company, but investing in their products. She clearly didn't have much of an idea about what they were. The 299 bucks is 299 bucks. And the stock is now $500 million uh, increased in value. And the company doesn't really seem to do much or produce anything. So Tiger King was my favourite of 2020. Um, Cobra Kai is the favourite of 2021 for anyone who is interested. Um, but Carol Baskin, driving value in the share market, um, uh, although I don't think she had any idea really what she was doing. On to more serious things though. Um, one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, we've got negative rates everywhere. There's you know, a long-standing sort of chase for yield, which has sort of disappeared. And one of the bigger themes that um, people in the markets are talking about is, okay, well, let's start looking away from the US, you know, whether it's emerging markets or, or other markets. Um, so I, being in Melbourne at the moment, uh, looked at National Australia Bank and thought this looks sort of quite interesting. So Australia's got sort of four big banks. They dominate uh, the, the sector. Um, National Australia Bank's down a few percent from pre-COVID levels. It's recovered from the, from the March lows, obviously, but it's still down 10% over the last five years. So there's been issues with the banking sector. There's been royal commissions. Um, and there's structural issues for the banks here as there are sort of around the world with retail margins getting squeezed and a lot of competition coming in from the neo uh, banks and, and the fintech world. But as you can see here, very strongly capitalised, 13.2% um, uh, tier one risk adjusted uh, capital ratio. Um, the full year result to September was pretty good. Um, it was certainly met expectations. Couple of billion dollars of NPAT, 
revenue better was better uh, and credit costs were better uh, slightly offset by higher expenses so credit provisions um, came in at 1.59 percent of risk weighted assets and that's probably pretty conservative that was done um, in the period through to uh, September and since then uh, Australia's sort of moved out of winter moved out of COVID uh, across the country there's probably been uh, a couple of hundred cases in total for the last four or five months so everything's sort of pretty normal um, and um, so that they've probably been pretty conservative on on what they're provided for in terms of bad bad and doubtful debts there's a chart here which I'll pop up as well um, from their presentation looking at the deferrals so in Australia um, the banks deferred um, loan repayments for small businesses and individuals the chart on the left for for mortgages the one on the right for uh, in uh, small businesses and you can see there um, the, the numbers have declined dramatically from June through September through to October uh, and there's more um, more have expired since then and basically people are back paying their loans so that's all sort of looking quite good um, and the outlooks looking pretty good uh, the net interest margin came in at 1.78% They've got a long-term cost reduction program going on uh, and most importantly and as I was alluding to when people are sort of looking at for, for yield around the world um, the strong capital position here at 13.2 percent and a return to uh, revenue growth and profit growth has allowed the regulators uh, the same as they have in the US to say okay well let's start paying higher dividends if you want to so their dividend payout ratio is going to go from 50% to 70%. And they'll be tracking at the current prices, maybe around about a 5% dividend yield. That's very attractive in a world of negative real rates um, at, the, at the country level, sort of across the globe. And in Australia, I think the rates are, you know, what are we, 10 basis points. So um, pretty serious yield. And I would think most international institutional investors would think they're probably going to get a pickup on the currency as well um, with US dollar weakness expected to continue over the next year or two uh, we see you know so you've got a five percent yield uh, maybe you pick up five percent on the currency that's a ten percent tailwind uh, before the share price is even picked up so I think people are going to find that quite attractive um, you can see here the return on assets are getting better the forecast years going forward uh, EPS bottomed out uh in this last year um and returning you know returning to sort of reasonably strong growth and as i mentioned the dividends going from sort of 60 cents uh forecast to go to 97 157 uh and that's not back to where it was prior to this but as i said a five percent dividend yield um is going to be pretty attractive so housing outlook looks pretty good as we've sort of you know fingers crossed seem to be sort of through COVID. Um, and uh, growth, gross return to markets. Um, tail risk is diminishing because of the quality, uh, because of the provisioning and likely to be conservative uh, as, as the economy strengthens as well. So trade structure, um, I'd be looking, um, thinking about getting long anyway. Um, so I'd be looking at April $24 calls. The stock's about 23.50 or so at the moment. Uh, volatility is pretty low uh, so these are sort of 90 cents each um, and so I would do a calendar ratio I'd buy you know, two of those sell one of February 24 uh, for 40 cents so total all-in cost a dollar 40 uh, option uh, contracts in Australia a thousand shares per contract not a hundred so um, just I've got to bear that in mind when I adjust my thought process from from the US, so $1.40. And then if the Feb expires, um, if the stock doesn't pick up, we can assess the state of play and there's a March contract as well. So we can potentially go and sell um, another March contract uh, ahead of that April one and lower the co entry cost a little further. So that's, um, despite the frothiness, um, there's a long idea that I'm giving some thought to. And I think, it, you know, it's. The stock specifically does look quite good and interesting, but I feel like the whole thing's going to be driven by uh, global investors saying, okay, 
Australia's probably got a tailwind on the currency. Here's a 5% yielding stock. Um, let's get involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it certainly sounds interesting and nice to nice to hear about some, some options uh, outside of the US as well. So one to look out for. Um, Jason, what about you? What have you been looking at? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a short idea. Um, so I uh, just wanted to quickly say it's, it's an interesting call on NAB because um, a lot of us uh, sort of in the prop trading world and the um, hedge fund world have had what, what used to be called the widow makers trade on mm -hmm. time, which is yep. obviously short the Aussie banks for all the well-known, well-rehearsed reasons. So that's a, that's a really interesting call from uh, Anthony um, and one which I think merits. Uh, I'm certainly going to take a look at that myself, actually. Um, so back to my idea. So I've got a short idea. Uh, Live Nation, tickers LYV, uh, market cap $15.7 billion, share price around 73 bucks. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people know what they do, but just for those of you that don't, um, they describe themselves as the world's premier live entertainment company, which to be fair, they probably are. They own things like Live Nation, Ticketmaster, Frontline Management Group, um, you know, pretty simple to understand. So they basically uh, promote, market and sell uh, live concerts for artists. Um, they also own and operate uh, quite a few venues around the world. So anyone who's familiar with the House of Blues venues, uh, the Fillmore in San Francisco, the Wembley Arena over here in London they own. Um, they basically, apart from selling tickets and reselling tickets, they're, all, they're also in the business of um, li other live entertainment events like sort of specialised motorsports. Um, they are active across the globe in 46 countries, but two thirds of their revenue comes from the US. So that's really, you know, what it's all about for them. Um, so just going through the sort of quantitative side of things, as we always do. Um, <laughs> so can't talk about PEs because clearly um, 2020 was a massive uh, loss making year. Uh, and in fact, uh, for this year, F1 and next year, F2, they're still predicted at a net basis to be losing money. So just to put the numbers into context, uh, uh, they're predicted the consensus is a loss of $8.18 for last year, um, which we haven't had the results for yet. That They're due in early February. Um, we got uh, negative $1.94 uh, consensus for this year and basically flat to small negative for 2022 on the earnings side. So sales... Uh, clearly, they plummeted last year down 84%. So we're looking at a bounce back this year, of course, from a very low base. So we're looking at sales growth this year of 290% uh, and next year um, 59%. Uh, obviously, I can't talk about P ratios or earnings growth rates. doesn't make any sense. Now, into the specifics of the idea, let's talk about you know why you might buy this stock because this stock has had a um, quite a strong rally off the lows and it's in fact back to basically where it was at the beginning of last year before the pandemic um, hit. So the bull argument, um, I can find three points. Um, these are those. So firstly, uh, the last numbers that we saw were Q3. Um, so the end of Q3, 83% uh, of ticket holders um, that uh, had had their concerts deferred had not asked for a refund. So the, the kind of thinking being that therefore, you know, America, but globally, people that go to concerts are kind of chomping at the bit to get out of the house and, and get along to concerts. Um, the, the market is looking at them evolving the model slightly from into a hybrid of uh, still mainly in person, but also virtual ticketing as well. Um, so that's point number one is basically, you know, kind of pent up uh, demand. Um, number two, they, you know, they've, they've got large cash burn. So they've addressed last year um, some of their costs. They've taken out $200 million of costs during the course of last year, which obviously is going to feed through and help them uh, on the bottom line. And number three, um, because they really are the dominant player and they've managed to keep going, a lot of the competition is a lot smaller in terms of the promotion business. Um, and a lot of those guys have either disappeared or just been really 
even more hit. And so the thinking is that LYV will actually be in a stronger bargaining position um, with venues and musicians than they, than they previously were. Um, so where does that all lead us to on the kind of ball front? Well, um, it basically leads to consensus estimates being for next year, for 2022, because this is when they see the recovery. It's really, it's really 2022. Um, so this is where I'm kind of going with this because I'm essentially saying I think the market has got ahead of itself. But, you know, so you know, consensus um, estimates are looking at uh, revenues of 11 and a half billion um, and adjusted EBITDA of 1.1 billion. So that's not at the net level, that's EBITDA. These are basically the same numbers that they reported in 2019. So the last sort of pre-COVID year, okay? Uh, in terms of why I am bearish on them, um, number one, these guys, even though they've reduced costs, they still have massive cash burn. They're still burning $175 million a month, which is clearly just, it's clearly over half a billion per quarter. Um, even the, the bulls are assuming at least two more quarters of losses at the same rate. Um, and uh, potentially break even uh, by the end of Q2 of this year. Now, even if, so if they're correct on that, that still is gonna add $1.1 billion to LYV's debt, which brings me on to the point number two, because they already have net debt of 4.7 billion, and that's if you don't include their operating lease liabilities, which are 1.6 billion. So add 1.1 billion to that, of the bull case um, in terms of the debt accrued between now and when these guys might approach break even. Um, but even using um, the 4.7 billion net debt figure, which is the figure as of end of September, um, using 2019's EBITDA, you, you're still getting a net debt to EBITDA ratio of over six times, okay, which is, which is hefty. Um, so point number three, we don't know when they will be able to hold concerts. No one does in terms of having pre-COVID levels of attendance. The expectation, I'd say more hope, but let's say expectation seems to be for limited capacity performances Q2, Q3, within inverted commas, normal crowds, Q4 this year, stroke Q1 next year. So to put that another way in terms of the numbers, the market seems to expect LYV will increase, will take its concert revenues up from 2 billion over the course of this year to 9.4 billion in 16 months, something which took them 16 years to do leading up to 2019, okay? Um, point number four, if we assume that everything goes to plan and that everybody um, that needs it has been vaccinated um, into 2022, it seems reasonable to assume that there are still there's still gonna be a scheduling backlog. And also, you know, I think there's a question mark over whether everybody is going to be prepared to jump straight back into full shoulder to shoulder venues. And we're seeing this, you know, we, you're seeing this with when we have lockdowns being relaxed, you don't immediately see um, people rushing back into the urban areas, the, pe the people that commute, they are still working from home. They're still, there's still a fear factor out there. Um, I mean, just listening to uh, the the CEO of the Canary Wharf Estate this morning on the radio, um, you know, to put to put these numbers out there, he was talking about um, they normally have a hundred thousand workers at Canary Wharf um, permanently. They have thirty to forty thousand visitors daily. Um, they're currently they've currently got five thousand people there. Now, he thinks that they're going to all rush back when lockdown finishes. I beg to differ. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and if it does happen, it's going to be much slower than, than I think the market thinks. So point number five, um, even pre-pandemic, this company struggled to make money at the net income level. So even in 2019, they actually still lost $5 million at the net level. And they lost money on a net income basis in the previous four years. So 19, 18, 17, and 16 were all losers. Um, and my last point is, um, is really, it's almost like a demographic point, but if you look at ticket pricing over the last decade, there's been 
Um, so despite what the Fed and the Bank of England tells you, we, we all see inflation, but we see it in different areas. And there's been inflation in ticket pricing. And the average price of a ticket to a concert these days is over 100 bucks. Now, for, you, for the younger guys out there, the younger people who are more budget minded, they're increasingly being priced out of concerts. Now, if you look at um, the acts that uh, these guys put on, only two of the, of the top 10 bands that gave them the highest grossing tours were formed in the last 30 years. That's Ed Sheeran and Coldplay, and Coldplay are hardly new kids on the block. So the rest of the, um, the top 10 um, tour, grossing tourers, highest grossing tourers, came from people like U2, Guns N' Roses, Rolling Stones. These are all bands that the boomers love. Now, I don't know what uh, people see elsewhere around the world, but my experience in the UK is that the, the boomers are the ones that are the most afraid of this virus. So I kind of question whether the boomers are coming back in the numbers that they used to go to concerts. Um, they seem to be the ones that are most fearful for their health. Um, so trade structure. This thing is, it's got 10% short interest. So there's a short out there. Um, I've been looking in an April put spread, which I think looks pretty attractive. The problem is that um, the bid offer spreads um, in the options market for this one are fairly wide. So, um, you know, it kind of comes with that caveat, but um, you can see there's definitely a way through here. Looking at uh, going long of this, the, uh, the 70, 55 put spread. So what I mean by that, this is for April 2021. So you basically buy, um, let's say, one of the April 70 strike puts for $5.30. You can sell one of the April 55 puts for a dollar fifty, which obviously gives you a net debit of three dollars eighty. Now, if the stock drops to fifty five, which is is not um, unreasonable um, to assume by any stretch, and actually, um, I hate to quote charts, but if you look at the chart, um, it's basically around the two hundred day moving average. Which I'd say, if it does drop, um, as I expect it to drop, then you know that's probably where you'd see the first decent support. Um, this spread works quite well on, on that sort of chart basis. So going long the April 70 put, short the 55 put, is going to cost you around 380. If it goes to 55, you've got a potential profit there of $11.20, which basically gives you um, the kind of rate win-loss ratio that we look for, which is uh, 2.95, so almost three times win-loss ratio. Um, and, uh, you know, failing that, then you can obviously always short the stock as well or instead of the, the chart is kind of a bit, mer it's a bit middle of the road at the moment. It's um, not screaming at you um, either way. But uh, I think that the, uh, the the put spread looks pretty, pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it certainly seems, certainly seems uh, interesting. Uh, one I'm going to take a look at as well, for sure. Um, what about you, Anthony? Should we, should we go back to you? Yes, uh, thanks, Chris. I've got a, a short that I'm looking at as well. Uh, not quite as sensible as uh, Jason's one, um, for all the right reasons. I think Jason's Live Nation idea looks, uh, uh, yeah, sort of quite compelling. Um, and I'm looking at shorting plug, plug power. Um, if you look at the share price chart, you'll think I'm potentially crazy and I'm sort of not entirely convinced that I'm not myself but this is a hydrogen full fuel cell company uh, mostly for forklifts they've got deals with Amazon and Walmart so a whole bunch of good things going on they just raised uh, one and a half billion dollars in cash uh, through a placement uh, for 12 percent of the stock to SK group out of Korea and they've just announced a joint venture with Renault so a um, whole bunch of reasons why you'd probably think, okay, well, this sounds like a company with uh, lots of good things on the horizon. But it's going to need those things and a lot more as far as I can see. Um, revenue for the last three years has gone from 132 mil to 236 mil, forecast at 329. Market cap's 30 bill, so it's trading at 100 times revenue. Um, the revenue growth that they've got is fine, but it's certainly not enough to warrant 100 times revenue. 
uh, net incomes negative and negative 85 mil, um, 100 negative 100 mil, 100 mil and 60 mil for the next three years is what's forecast. And obviously, as a result, you know, those margins across the board from gross profit margin down to uh, net profit margin are, are all massively uh, negative. And they've been having these uh, accumulated losses for a long time. The company's been around for, for a long time. Uh, $1.4 billion of accumulated losses. Uh, and that's broadly been funded by uh, just equity raisings on a very consistent basis over over a long period of time. So as I said, um, the share price currently is about $70 on the back of this Renault deal. Uh, recently, they took money from SK Group. Uh, that was at $29 a share. The stock is up 1,400% uh, over the last year, and it's up 80% in January alone. Um, so it's getting pretty pricey, but frothiness can continue for a long time. So um, yeah, there is the real risk that it continues to, to go up from, from there. A couple of reasons why I am thinking that this is a short though. Um, they have issued a lot of shares over, over recent years, and that seems to be how they sort of run their business and fund their business because the operations don't generate the cash that you would want. So the share count has gone from 176 mil to 371 mil, so uh, more than doubling from 2015 uh, through to this last September quarterly result. Since then, you've had this new 50 million shares off to SK Group as well, and, um, and they've done another placement um, at the same time. Uh, a year ago, they were issuing stock pretty rapidly at $2.50 a share. So issuing her at 29 is better than at $2.50. Um, but the issue, one of the issues I've got um, is these deals with Walmart and Amazon. When you look into the financial statements, um, they used to get down to sort of note 12 and it all gets a little bit boring. But what they've done with Walmart and Amazon is they've offered them incentives to buy their fuel cells for um, forklifts and, and warehouse equipment. And we all know that lots of businesses will offer incentives. Uh, you see all the people on TV selling their things and they'll throw in a free set of steak knives. People might give you a discount. Um, you know, there's two for one offers. What this company, Pluggers, seems to be doing, as far as I can make out, they are offering stock in the company or options or in this case warrants um, at what are now very very low prices in order to get order flow from amazon and walmart so just to give you an idea for every sort of 50 million in orders uh, which makes up the bulk of their sales uh, they were issuing warrants to amazon at sort of less than two dollars fifty a share uh, now, at the time, that probably seemed like a reasonable price. The stock was trading at about a dollar, dollar fifty, dollar eighty. Um, problem is that stock is now seventy dollars, and this deal is still running. And so Amazon uh, can sit there and just say, "Well, yes, I'll take that stock at two dollars fifty a share. Thank you. It's now seventy. Um, and so you, you're issuing stock at a very cheap price relative to the current price." And that's stock that I would think Amazon will be getting on there and selling um, pretty rapidly. In fact, they can take a $50 million order and given the, the differential between their $2 uh, price that they've got to pay and the current share price, uh, they don't even need to take possession of the goods. They can just sell the stock and they're making money hand over fist, hundreds of millions of dollars. And that is at the expense of existing shareholders. So huge amounts of dilutions going on. Uh, Amazon's already picked up 50, I think 55 million shares or that, sorry, that's their total. Walmart can get the same, all at very low prices. So this is very concerning um, and will mean that it's very hard for this company to, even if they do achieve their sales growth targets that they've talked about, uh, when you get down to the stock level, there's not going to be very much to go around because there's so many shares being issued. At the same time, there's been quite a bit of insider selling and uh, Jason made a valid point that insider buying is more interesting because people are actually putting their money in their pocket. A lot of the insider selling is often uh, through compensation they received stock 
stock and options uh, over the years that people have worked there. And that's what's going on at the moment. Um, but one of the things is, is there, well, there's a couple of things. There's, insiders have been selling rapidly for, you know, for more than a year. So selling plenty of stock at much lower levels than this. And if they're selling stock at $5 a share and $10 a share, uh, they clearly don't have a great deal of comfort that that was uh, you know, a, a, a cheap price for the company. Uh, so they certainly wouldn't be thinking this is a cheap price of, for the company. I think they'd be thinking it's massively overvalued. And the chief operating officer recently uh, sold a lot of stock just prior to a capital raising, which is a big no-no. Um, they then pointed to the fact and said, oh, well, it's, it's part of a regular trading plan. So a trading plan put in place and you sell stock on a regular basis. Problem was that that trading plan was put in place the day before um, they sold the stock. So it's not like it was sitting there from 18 months ago and then been thinking about this. It all seemed fairly rapid. And the stock that he sold was uh, exercising of options that weren't due to expire for five or six years. That means he clearly thought that in five or six years' time, it's not going to be anywhere near this current share price. So these are all just sorts of things that, um, you know, that are a big concern. It, as I said, they're doing capital raising. They've got lots of cash on the balance sheet now. Um, so they're feeding the ducks while they're quacking. And the, and the market's quacking pretty hard because uh, it's up 80% uh, since January, uh, January 1st. So massive rise, um, but you don't want to stand in front of a freight train. So there's no way you could go and short this stock um, because for all you know, it could be 100 bucks next week. Uh, but there are trade structures that you can sort of take advantage, you know, and one of them is a ratio uh, spread. So I'm having a look at that. Ratios often don't stack up um, particularly well. The, um, the pricing of them um, often doesn't, doesn't really make sense. And I'm still sort of working my way through this one, but it looks like you can uh, sell one of the June $65 puts um, for $18. Uh, obviously, the implied volatility is super high in this in this company um, and the options market. And by the June um, fifty five dollar uh, puts, and you buy two of those, so that's the ratio. That's what I'd be looking at doing for eleven dollars each. So that's about a four dollar outlay. Now, the reason why this sort of make sense with a company that's gone up 1,400% and potentially could fall 90% um, is that if the stock continues up from here and is above $65 and goes to 100, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, I, my options would just expire worthless and my outlay of $4 a share is, is the only risk I've had. The, the big payoff is obviously if the stock falls even just back to where it was in November, um, you would be looking at sort of uh, sort of many multiples uh, of return, hundreds of percent, um, because of the, the the leverage involved. The risk that you've got is that the stock sort of sits there and hovers around uh, current levels, um, and and that's when you're going to get exposed. Um, you've got some uh, some exposure all the way down to fifty five dollars. Now the thing is. Have a look at that chart again, and you tell me that you think this stock is going to hover at this price for the next six months. It's going one way or the other. So if it goes hard from here and goes up to $100, you can close out the short leg um, of the option, and then you've got some very out-of-the-money speculated ones sitting there in case things go uh, haywire. Um, but I'd be more inclined to think that it sort of returns back down to lower levels as people realize that there's not the genuine sales volume coming through that Walmart's recent order is simply, I would say, just to get exposure, uh, just to pick up these options. There's hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they're, you know, the Walmart CFO, small money for Walmart, but um, not to be sneezed at when literally all you've got to do is place an order for some fuel cells, take the stock they've given you um, and move on. So little little ritzy, a little spicy, um, could go either way, but that's sort of the key component um, uh, of the trade structure that allows 
uh, you're not to get blown out of the water if this uh, frothiness continues. That's a that's a pretty fascinating one to have a look at. Um, certainly, lots going on behind the scenes, and I know there's there's actually quite a craze in uh, hydrogen stocks at the moment. Anyway, it's certainly one of the relevant kind of themes today. Um, well, gents, it's been a pleasure as always to hear from you both. Um, great to get your views on on markets and obviously the equities that we've talked about. The the ideas that we discussed today were, were really really interesting. So thank you both for for coming on. Uh, we'll finish up there today though. Uh, for all of you guys watching, make sure you head over to our website to check out our upcoming events that we have at ITPM. I know we've got two towards the end of the month, uh, one for ITPM alumni, one for first timers. So there's something for, for everyone up there. And uh, as for what's on your mind, we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with another episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it this week and we'll see you then.